thing. We are um, rapidly approaching the end of the semester and uh, you guys just finished your second exam. And uh, from this point on, your next few exams are gonna be uh, more in, in your hands and your responsibility to develop uh, some videos and some lectures that are going to be representative of a master level student who is taking um, pathology. So uh, I will give you guys some instructions on what's coming down the pipe with uh, how I'm gonna ask you to prepare for your final two exams. It will be group work, group efforts, and you guys are going to teach me a thing or three uh, about human pathology. But I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of discretion and a little bit of freedom to kind of pick what areas you are interested in. So um, what we're gonna talk about today is going to be hemodynamics and hemodynamic disorders and we'll kind of talk about what these things are and how important they are for both normal physiology for pathophysiology and, and, and incredibly important for exercise physiology so we'll give some different varieties and different flavors of examples uh, as we get deeper into this discussion so um, let's talk about a little bit of what hemodynamics are so by now, you know that the health and the well-being of cells and the tissue and tissue um, kind of really depend on an intact circulation to deliver goods uh, to these tissues, such as nutrients. Um, so normal fluid homeostasis is, is really important. And when we're talking about hemodynamics, we're talking about, obviously, blood and all of the wonderful things that blood carries. Um, so in this chapter, we're going to kind of review some of the major disturbances that happens involving uh, the hemodynamic system. Um, we're going to look at uh, just kind of normal blood flow and, and talk about some of the things that are being dropped off by the blood. We're going to be talking about a little bit of vasculature, um, mainly focusing on the capillaries. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the heart as it is the pump that is going to push the blood through the, through the system. Um, throughout the body and then we're going to be talking about um, some of the chemistry and some of the physics that are associated with hemodynamics so um, we'll we'll just kind of review a little bit about stroke volume and cardiac output and things like that because uh, obviously if the uh, pump which is the heart is strong then we know cardiac output and ejection fraction and stroke volume are all going to be greater which is going to help uh, hemodynamics uh, substantially however if we're in a pathogenic state uh, and we have any sort of issues with uh, the heart or any sort of issues with the blood or any sort of issues with the vasculature that holds the blood well then we're going to have changes in pressure and if we have changes in pressure that's obviously going to feed back and uh, interrupt how the heart beats and uh, how the heart fills with blood and things like that. So we have this circuit uh, per se that contains many, many pieces, but we'll get into that in a little more detail in a bit. So let's talk about hemodynamics and what it means. So hemodynamics uh, is literally blood movement. Um, and we want to make sure that we have homeostasis of hemodynamics. And this basically refers to um, the regulation of blood circulation to meet the demands of different organs and different tissues. So if you think about uh, how when we, begin, when we begin to exercise and the muscles begin to, to contract, well, there's going to be a greater demand of both energy. There's going to be a greater demand of oxygen. There's going to be a greater demand of substrates such as glucose and fatty acids. Um, there's going to be a greater demand to remove waste. Right. So um, when these muscles are contracting, there's going to be a greater demand to deliver blood to uh, that area. Uh, if you're on a if you're on a maybe a stationary bike, then you're going to have a majority of that blood flow being shifted to the legs. Uh, where if you're doing uh, maybe an elliptical and you have your arms uh, involved in it as well, you're going to have more evenly distribution of blood because those contracting muscles are going to need uh, all the good stuff that's that's in there. So um, when we have uh, this homeostasis of uh, the hemodynamic system, it, it kind of involves this uh, intimate interaction between peripheral metabolic needs, uh, vascular adaptations to meet the needs of cardiac adaptations, and we know that these things kind of provide 
the driving force of circulating blood. So if we have favorable adaptations to the heart, well, then we're going to have favorable metabolic adaptations. We're going to have favorable vascular adaptations, where if we have disruption uh, to the heart or to the vascular system, well, then we're going to have non-favorable adaptations, which are going to kind of move us more into a pathogenic state. So um, the, the regulation of this blood circulation really depends on several components. Um, there are static components. Uh, there are physical properties with different vessels. There are different characteristics of fluid going through the vessels. So there's lots of different things to kind of consider here. Uh, there's also forces, uh, hydrostatic forces, um, onconic forces, different pressures, osmotic pressure. So there's all these all these different things that are involved in this this homeostasis, even solutes, right? So if you guys don't know what a solute is, that's kind of like the, the goods that are... Um, soluble in the blood. So things like glucose and things like protein and things like, um, you know, potassium, things like that. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about these physical laws that kind of regulate hemodynamics. I'm going to draw you guys some pictures that really kind of give you an in-depth look at this. And um, we were really going to focus on what happens when we leave this fluid homeostasis. Uh, as this is a pathology class, uh, obviously that's what we're going to do. Um, so that was just a little introduction. And here we're going to talk about the system, right? So I, I've already kind of mentioned this, but let's talk about it a bit, a bit more. Uh, we have the heart, we have the blood vessels, and then we have the organs, right? And um, we also have the blood itself. That's why I have a picture of here. So within that blood, we have uh, plasma, we have serum, we have cells, we have uh, immune cells, right? White blood cells, which you guys talked about in that last uh, conversation, that last lecture that we did. Um, we have fuels such as fatty acids. We have uh, lots of different protein floating around, right? Albumin is one of the major proteins that are floating around in the blood, and albumin is going to be one of the major characteristics that helps maintain a certain pressure within the blood vessels. You guys are going to see how important albumin is and protein concentration within the vessels are. Um, we have things like uh, lipids. We have HDL, LDL. We have all these different things floating around within the blood. So the blood, not just, oops, sorry about that. Let me go back. Uh, not just the vessels themselves or the organs, but the blood itself is very important. So we will see in detail where um, we start to develop issues like type 2 diabetes uh, or type 1 diabetes or anything that's going to cause a major change in global glucose homeostasis. And when I say global, I mean throughout the body. Um, if we have a high level of glucose circulating in the blood, that's going to change the viscosity of the blood. That's going to change the pH of the blood. That's going to change the um, how much glucose is delivered to other tissues. So there's there's all these different factors that we have to we have to think about here. So um, this process is very important and it's so that the body can essentially maintain itself and any sort of problems we have with this um, affect uh, the body on a global scale where the heart will have a hard time um, adjusting to changes in the blood and changes in pressure. The blood vessels will also have a hard time changing to changes in pressure and decrease or an increase in heart function. So an example of this is uh, people that have hypertension, people that have chronic high blood pressure, people that have uh, hyperlipidemia where they have lots of lipids in the blood, people that have high levels of glucose in the blood. Some of the first vessels that begin to feel uh, this sort of uh, adverse change in the physiology is uh, the blood vessels within your eye, right? So um, those, bless those vessels are uh, very sensitive to pressure changes. So if there's a massive increase in pressure, um, those capillaries within the eye, they begin to burst. And we have little small bouts of edema that begin to develop in the eye. And if that keeps turning into an issue, well, then we can have blindness that is caused by high blood pressure, which is associated to with uh, type 2 diabetes and high levels of glucose, right? So, um, okay, so on this next slide, we're just going to talk about kind of the three major components of maintaining um, 
homeostasis of the hemodynamic system. And there are many, many more, but I'm just trying to keep this simple for you guys. Um, vessel wall integrity. So this is going to talk about kind of the endothelium or the endothelial cells that line the walls of the capillaries. Uh, I'll show you some pictures of those. The maintenance of intravascular pressure. So the key word being maintenance there. We don't want lots of fluctuations in there. And, and keep in mind that this change in uh, intravascular pressure can come as a result of a pathological condition and exercise can also kind of change this. Um, and we'll look at some examples of exercise near the end here. And then the other one would be uh, osmosis or osmolarity within certain physiological ranges. And we're going to talk about how this and this and this are all kind of intertwined with one another. So it's important that you know that um, blood, I have this picture here. This is a kind of a picture of a uh, vacutainer that has different sort of sections of blood. We know that 90% of this is water, right? So that means that a lot of this is going to be able to penetrate the walls of the endothelium. And 10% of this is your solutes, right? So this is your glucose, your sodium, your potassium, um, calcium, things like that. And then we have uh, a small section here, which is your white blood cells, right? Your leukocytes, you know what that is. Thrombocytes, your platelets, right? So that's this right here. And then the rest of it is erythrocytes, which is kind of this red blood cell protein level here, right? So uh, the big takeaway is that most of this blood is water and stuff inside of the water that needs to get to tissues. Um, so now if we move on, when we talk about changes in hemodynamics and alterations, um, most of the time these are pathological conditions. So these alterations can uh, occur and they'll alter these things here, right? So they'll alter vessel wall integrity. They'll alter pressure that is supposed to be maintained throughout the body. And they will alter this uh, osmolarity within physiological ranges. It, these things will all change when there's the presence of uh, any sort of disease or complication. Um, we can have a decrease in plasma protein, right? Or we can have an increase in plasma protein. And I told you before when I was talking about albumin that the protein in the blood plays a major role in maintaining, let me go back, maintaining this intravascular pressure, osmolarity, and wall integrity, okay? So when we have changes in protein concentration, whether up or down, uh, these things will change. And then we have changes in hemodynamics. So this can be an increase or a decrease. Uh, alterations to endothelial cells functions will ultimately uh, have adverse changes in those three major staples of hemodynamics. Um, and there are certain um, pathological conditions as well that will basically alter this. So I'm keeping it very simple. This is an overview. We're not going to do a deep dive on these diseases, but I do you I do want you to know them. And then any sort of change in these major players, right? Whether it's osmolarity, whether it's pressure, whether it's wall integrity, whether it's all of them, it's going to result in some form of edema. And we'll define this in a little bit uh, as we get further along. But let's look at some of the complications and the diseases that are associated with changes in hemodynamics. And you can see them listed here. You could have impaired venous re return, right? So if you have, uh, let's say you have poor circulation, you have poor blood pressure, you have poor muscle pump action. Let's say you get pooling of the blood in the legs or in the feet, right? You can get mild edema there. And many of you guys have probably experienced a lot of that when you travel. Doesn't matter how old you are, how healthy you are, how young you are. Um, when you sit for long periods of time, especially in a pressurized plane, your feet swell. And if you want to put that to the test, uh, take your shoes off uh, right when the flight takes off and then try to put them on midway through the flight. You'll see that your feet are retaining water. So where is that water coming from, guys? Well, it's coming from your blood, right? Just like sweat. When you sweat, the majority of the sweat that is appearing on your skin is coming from your blood. So that should tell you that the water in the blood has this remarkable ability uh, to move basically outside of the vessel 
and towards your skin for evaporation, but it could also move outside of the vessel and go into the interstitial space of the cells. Or it can move outside of the vessel and go into the interstitial space and then move into the actual skeletal muscle cell or whatever other cell because you guys know that most cells are living in aqueous solutions, right? Uh, so water makes up a majority of the cells of the interstitial space of the blood, right? So you guys get the point here. This water is mobile and depending on these things here, its mobility um, could be disadvantageous, right? Um, people that have congestive heart failure, well, that makes sense because that's the pump. And if the pump is altered, that means that the blood's going to be altered, right? And the blood delivery is going to be altered. Uh, liver cirrhosis, uh, the liver is very uh, important in storing and secreting proteins, right? Uh, it, uh, proteins and lipids together, such as um, lipoproteins, right? So when you have these uh, tissues that are important for maintaining certain concentrations of protein in the blood or glucose in the blood or, or any other sort of thing floating in the blood, well, if this system begins to fail, well, that means that there's going to be possibly changes in protein concentration, whether that protein is going to be, um, let's just draw so I can start setting you up for these next slides. Maybe the protein levels are going to increase right? That's an arrow going up. Maybe the protein levels are going to decrease, but we know if protein levels change, right? A decrease in protein, uh, plasma protein can result in mild edema, right? But it also goes the other way. An increase in protein can also change uh, how uh, osmolarity is, um, occurs. Um, venous obstruction or compression. So this could be things where we have a blockage of a vein or we have potentially um, thrombosis or um, atherosclerosis developing somewhere, right? So here's that thrombosis here. We know that these two are kind of uh, associated with one another. Lower extremity activities that would kind of be that as well, right? I told you if you guys were on a plane, arterial dilation, right? If we have uh, either dilation or constriction that is occurring when it should not happen, uh, well, that is obviously going to, let me erase this, that is obviously going to have an impact on uh, blood pressure. And again, if we have a change in blood pressure, uh, we want to maintain consistent intravascular pressure, right? So I hope I beat, I beat a dead horse on that and you guys kind of understand what I'm saying there. Um, now let's talk a little bit. Let's kind of like start introducing you a little bit to this protein thing and this onconic pressure. Okay, so all I want to do on this particular slide here is kind of set the stage. I want to introduce you guys to the players before I start drawing uh, pictures for you. So this is this is um, talking about something called hypoproteinemia and hyperproteinemia. And this just basically means that if there's a low level of proteins in the blood, meaning hypo, that's going to change a couple of things that are occurring within the capillaries. And if there's an increased level of protein, such as hyper uh, proteinemia, then that's going to change uh, certain things, certain pressures in the blood that is going to impact the movement of water and also the movement of goods and also the integrity of the endothelial endothelium. Sorry. So what you see here is um, I'm just kind of setting the stage for you guys we see the capillary wall. So the capillaries are made up of single endothelial cells, right? Lined up together. And these are not very strong. They're very, very sensitive to pressure. Um, so any sort of abrupt increases in pressure has the capability of bursting these things open, which is why I told you a few slides ago uh, that vessel wall integrity is uh, of great importance. Um, so we can see here that, uh, we have certain types of pressure. First is on conic pressure and then hydrostatic pressure. I'm just introducing these, um, pressures to you. We also have the interstitial space. This is the space outside of the blood vessels where the cells are usually bathing in an aqueous solution, which is water. So what I'm trying to show you here is that if we have changes in blood flow, whether it's decreasing 
or whether it's increasing. And we have changes in protein concentration, whether it's decreasing or increasing. These variables are going to have a substantial impact on the movement of water and goods out of the vessel or back into the vessel. So you can see here that there's things being brought back in. That's how we get rid of waste, right? Um, and there's things being pushed out. And we want things to be pushed out and pulled back in without destroying our endothelium walls and without disturbing blood flow. All right. So this is a very uh, complicated dance here that is really dependent on these pressures, this onconic and hydrostatic pressure. And I'm sure you guys have heard this in uh, previous lectures, maybe in physiology, but now we're going to kind of fold in this hypoproteinemia and hyperproteinemia. So I'm just introducing the players. We have proteins, we have hydrostatic pressure, we have onconic pressure, we have the capillary walls, and we have the interstitial space. So those are the major players. Okay, so now that the players are introduced, let's talk about what happens when uh, we have changes in this, uh, this uh, homeostasis of hemodynamics. Um, we get something called edema, and we get edema in a pathogenic state, and we also can get edema when we're exercising. So let's explore these a little more. So um, what what is edema? Well, you guys should kind of already know what this is, um, but it's basically swelling that is caused by fluid trapped in your body's tissue. So when we go back to this, that essentially means that when we have fluid moving out, let me pick a color here, or being pushed out, right? And not being pulled back in at the same rate or at a weight rate that's similar, then what starts to happen is that within this interstitial space, we get, we basically start collecting fluid. And when we collect fluid, this is just a giant pool of water if you couldn't tell. So I'm just gonna say H2O, right? When we start collecting fluid, this is going to impact the function of the cells and they're going to become uh, hypotonic or hypertonic. Uh, it kind of depends if water's going in or out and that's going to alter how cells function uh, because it's going to change their environment. It's going to change their milieu. Um, so let me go back to this slide. Um, and certain diseases will basically cause this to happen everywhere so it's not it's not uh isolated to a certain tissue and that's what's so dangerous about changes to hydrostatic homeostasis so when we go when we get to, to a state of hydrostatic stress where things are starting to go wrong uh, this is going to start to cause water to be pushed out of the blood into tissues and then we're going to get an expansion of those tissues particularly the cellular space where water uh, tends to bathe the cells all right, so that is a just generic definition of what edema is. And I have a couple pictures here just to kind of solidify this for you. So you guys know that we have the capillaries, right? We have uh, the arterial side and we have the venous side. And we know what separates this is, well, when we have, let me just draw a line through here. When we have red blood cells going through, one of the things that they're dropping off is oxygen right so there we'll just draw this line right through there like that so when the red blood cells uh, are coming through the arterioles and they're going into these branches what's going to happen is they're going to line up in single file lines uh, as we go through the capillaries and what's going to happen to overall pressure here is it's going to drop right we don't want a lot of pressure in the capillaries because we know that the capillaries are made up of a single line of endothelium cells or endothelial cells, right? So endothelium is including all of them, or we can say endothelial, which is just including a single cell, right? And we know that there's a little bit of give between these two cells because that's what pushes the fluid out. And some things can get in some types of cells and some types of um, fuels and some types of proteins can kind of pass this barrier. Um, but they have to be small. They, they can't be something that's going to damage uh, this, this particular area, okay? So we know that 
Uh, when it's red, uh, O2 is going to diffuse out of the capillaries and it's going to be dropped off. And then we're going to pick up some waste here, maybe some CO2, right? Um, and then we're going to bring this deoxygenated, deoxygenated blood back to the heart, right? And it's going to undergo, oxi uh, we're going to oxidate the red blood cells again. Um, some other things to look at is uh, here is that interstitial space. So you can see that the cells, I'll just kind of dot some of the nuclei of the cells. You can see that some of these cells are bathing in aqueous solution here. And you can see that they're uh, essentially um, basically surrounded by capillaries and this is this is also the lymphatic system so it's important to understand that your lymph nodes are also woven in there you can see that here as well right so just different pictures to kind of show you here you can see uh, the capillaries here you can see the oxygen is being dropped off here are the interstitial space in the cells and then here is the deoxygenated venule side or venous side where the blood is going to be taken back to the heart all right so this is just kind of a picture to show you all of these things to show you how they're interrelated so if we have changes in onconic pressure and changes in hydrostatic pressure and we're going to have uh as a result of that we're going to have a ton of excessive water being pushed out of the capillaries well that water is going to sit here and sit here and sit here and sit here and it's basically going to create an expansion of that tissue and what that looks like is if we go to this next slide here you can see that um, when we have issues where water is being pushed out you can see here that we have edema and we have swelling of skeletal muscle and of the skin and then this is basically leading to uh in the feet uh we're, we're just going to get some swelling but when this happens in the eyes or in the liver or in the kidney or uh in other organs like the heart it's going to have a severely uh catastrophic impact on that tissue right so this is basically showing you how the water is basically going to cause swelling pretty pretty simple so how does edema occur so we basically have water being pushed into the interstitial space. Uh, it depends on the location of the edema. Uh, edema is going to have basically minor or profound effects. Uh, in the kidney, it's going to be far more profound than just in your feet. Uh, the lower extremities uh, causes swelling. But if we had edema, that's edema. That's not the right spelling. I apologize for that. Let me let me clean that up because I don't want to give you that. Oh, geez, that was just a typo. So let me fix that really quick. Give me a second. Edema, edema. There it is. Fixed and fixed. Um, and let's go back to the full scale here. Okay. Um, if we have this issue that occurs in the lungs, uh, obviously, this would destroy the alveoli in the lungs, and this would make uh, breathing next to impossible. Okay, so now um, let's talk about pressure. And Mr. Bob Ross here, who I must admit I have a very strange relationship with this man. I watch his videos when I can't sleep, and there's something very soothing about his voice that just knocks me right out. Um, so we are going to talk about pressure now. We're going to talk about some uh, some of the um, mechanisms that basically are going to increase and decrease pressure within the capillaries uh, that can cause edema. All right. So and I'm going to have a, a really good drawing for you guys here that's also going to help kind of describe this even more. So let's talk a little bit about these pressures now. Okay, so let's just kind of look at this with a little more detail before I move on and before we start, I start to draw things for you. Um, so you can see that uh, this hydrostatic pressure, this hydrostatic pressure uh, occurs, let me draw, let me get the pen color here. It occurs both inside the capillary, this is also called hydrostatic force, and outside of the capillary. In the interstitial space. Now, it, the hydrostatic pressure is much greater here at the arterial side 
than it is the Venus side. And um, you can kind of see that represented here, that here it's 35 millimeters and then here it's 17 millimeters uh, of force. So uh, as we get closer, as we move down the capillary and get closest to the Venus side, the pressure of hydrostatic pressure, hydrostatic force begins to reduce a little bit. Um, and this, then we have this onconic pressure and you can see that represented here by the blue. And Hanconic pressure is essentially the same throughout. It really doesn't change much because this pressure is dependent on protein concentration. So remember when I started telling you guys about uh, how protein levels, uh, whether they're too low or too high, can alter uh, blood pressure in the capillaries. Well, this is how one of the one of the mechanisms that causes that pressure to change is if we have a change in proteins, then we're going to have a change in onconic pressure. So normally protein gradients uh, or protein concentrations are pretty consistent, which maintains onconic pressure. So um, when we have a increase or when we have a high uh, hydrostatic pressure here, this is going to push goods out. Okay. And then when we have a reduction of hydrostatic pressure, or hydrostatic pressure, as you can see here, 17, and we have this maintained uh, pressure of onconic pressure here that's higher than that, this is going to start pushing things back in, right? So this is how we get waste and carbon dioxide and things out of the interstitial space and back into the bloodstream. And we get uh, the goods and the water uh, delivered uh, to the interstitial space through this major force here that is this hydrostatic force. And I will, I will, I will draw this for you guys momentarily. Um, I just wanted to kind of, again, introduce you to the names and starling forces um, and just talk about these a little bit. Okay, so more on this uh, to come in a bit. Okay, so um, one of the questions I uh, we'll probably ask you guys is how do we maintain homeostasis in hemodynamics? So essentially this is pretty easy. We just want to maintain normal fluid homeostasis. So, so what does that mean? That means absence of clotting after an injury. So if we, if we have an injury to a tissue, uh, we want to make sure that, uh, the clotting is acute and then it's done. We don't have the formation of excessive clotting because if we do have clotting, what is that going to do? that is going to impact pressure, uh, whether the, it's the pressure in the venous end or the arterial end. But just keep in mind, this is all a circuit, so it will all be impacted. So uh, we want to make sure that we only have kind of acute clotting and then it's removed. Uh, we don't want to have any ruptures or hemorrhaging. This would be an indication of a rupture or hemorrhaging where we have um, a vessel that is broken uh, due to pressure changes. And then we have red blood cells uh, moving out of the injury site that will obviously uh, not maintain hemodynamic homeostasis. Uh, we do not want local bleeding. What is that? Well, if we did have a rupture, uh, we do not want local bleeding that is going to extend long periods of time. So if you have uh, an, an issue like you, you get hit and you have a bruise, well, that bruise is going to be local bleeding. That's obviously going to be a sign of tissue and vascular damage, but it should be acute and it should dissipate. Uh, that tissue that is, or the fluid that is in the interstitial space should be reabsorbed back into the vessels. Uh, and then the protein that is sitting within the interstitial space that doesn't belong there, such as red blood cells and anything else that leaves the vascular system, uh, will probably be degraded by the uh, immune cells. And you guys know a lot about that uh, because we just talked about that. Um, and then uh, any sort of extensive hemorrhaging uh, that results in uh, any type of hypotension. Uh, obviously, it wouldn't be hypertension, right? Because if we have hemorrhaging of the blood, um, let's say we have a rupture that turns into a hemorrhage, well, that is going to cause a lot of blood cells to leave the uh, vascular system. We're going to have a decrease in pressure. What else will we also have? 
we will have a decrease in protein concentration because much of that is going to be leaving the site of the rupture. Um, and if we have a lot of pressure drop and we have a lot of protein loss, we're going to have changes in hemodynamic because if we have protein loss, let's just go back here. What is this word here? Hypoprotein, hyperproteinemia. Sorry, I've been talking for many hours today. My mouth is starting to get tired. Um, we're going to have changes in pressure. We're going to have changes in how uh, the body pushes out water and reabsorbs water on a normal basis. Um, now, how do we kind of disrupt homeostasis? Uh, we have abnormal homeostasis, which would basically be a result of everything I just mentioned in the previous slide. Um, we would have uh, blocked blood vessels. We would have hemorrhaging. We might have things like thrombosis um, and, or infarction. And you guys should know what thrombosis is. I have this picture here for a reason. Um, it's basically the formation of a solid or a semi-solid mass, um, as you can see here. And this, uh, this basically happens within the vascular system. And this, this mass is kind of a combination of red blood cells, as you can see here, uh, white blood cells, as you can see here, and platelets, uh, which are, mm, I don't see them on here, but there's not really a picture of platelets. Um, and then we have um, things like uh, uh, fibrin, which you can see here, right? Um, so uh, thrombosis, any sort of block would alter pressure. Uh, any sort of injury would alter pressure. Any sort of hemorrhage would alter pressure. Any sort of rupture would alter pressure. Um, so these are just kind of the basics of what would what would uh, occur. All right, so what I want to do now is do a little bit of drawing, and we're going to talk about these pressures that I kind of mentioned uh, here. And I told you that we're going to tie it all together. So just um, hold tight and let me set up the iPad and let's draw a little bit. And let's, uh, let's see if we can tie some of these things together and draw a clearer picture for you. So give me one second. Okay, so um, let's, let's do some drawing here. So um, the first thing I want to do is just kind of orient you guys to how, this, um, how blood flow works, uh, how the dynamics work in the capillary bed, and how when there's changes in these dynamics, we get... Uh, a ruptured microvascular system, which is your capillaries, and then we get edema, and then we get potentially inflammation or not. So it's important to understand that some edema is inflammatory and some is not inflammatory, and we'll talk about this in a, in a little bit. So let's let's meet Mr. Capillary here. So uh, I'm going to draw um, the arterial branch coming from the arterials, and then we got the capillary bed that kind of um, branches out and this is called um, this is called a capillary network because there's thousands of these things just kind of interwoven together and then we have this other end of the capillary which is blue and it's blue because this is the venous end and this is the side that's deoxygenated so I'm going to put V and then I'll put over here A for arterial end there's the A and then we have these, you know, various holes in the capillary. And in these holes that I'm drawing here, we have uh, cells that are sitting in interstitial fluid, right? And there's, there's cells in there and they're just waiting for all the, the waiting to be fed. They're waiting for you to, the capillaries to drop off all the good things that are in the blood. And then on this side, we have um, the same sort of thing, right? So just various holes in the capillaries where cell beds are. Um, and these cells, we're just say, are giving things back, right? They're giving off their waste, so the waste can be taken away. All right, so we have the arterial side, and then we have the venous side. And we know from what I said previously um, that there's these hydrostatic, so it's HSP, hydrostatic pressures and onconic pressures that are both pushing in and pulling out. And onconic pressure is also pushing things in and pulling things out. And that will make more sense in a moment. So when we have a normal blood vessel, um, let me draw the vessel. Here's, let's just say, here's the opening, right? 
and then here's the end of the vessel. We see that red blood cells are kind of traveling all about, and it's very high pressure that's pushing the blood. We got um, speed because the cells are moving very quickly, right? Um, and as we move through the vascular system and we go to the arteries and then those get smaller and we get to the arterioles, right? And those get smaller and we get to the arterial branches. And then we move into like these uh, capillary beds, right? Pressure starts to decrease with each one of these vessels. So we go from pretty high pressure here then to lower pressure, to even lower pressure, to even lower pressure in the capillary beds, right? Um, and this happens because oxygen likes to be released from the red blood cells um, when the pressure is lower. So here in these capillary beds is where oxygen would be dropped off, right? Because it's the right environment. It's the right pressure for oxygen to be dropped off. Um, where if we were up here at the lungs, I'm going to do my best to draw the lungs. That's a lung that's a lung right here's the bronchial branches and where we at when we're in the lungs this is a very high partial pressure part of the body and that is purposeful because oxygen likes that sort of environment to bind to hemoglobin so up here we're going to have strong affinity for binding and then when we get to the capillaries we're going to have a low affinity for binding and a higher affinity for release okay so this is this is what the blood flow looks like when we're in normal uh, blood vessels. Now, when we get down to the capillaries, what happens is once we're at these arterial branches here, the red blood cells begin to line up in a single file line. And they do that because it's going to decrease their speed and it's going to allow greater time for these red blood cells to move through and deliver their cargo, which can be oxygen. We'll talk about some other things that are happening here, right? Um, we want to get rid of as much oxygen as possible because all the cells that are sitting in here and here and all the cells in the surrounding interstitial space, which is here, they're all waiting for those goods. And then as the red blood cell starts to move through here and it drops off its oxygen, it becomes deoxygenated and then it starts to pick up things like CO2, right? To take back to the heart to eventually become reoxygenated, right? So that's what's gonna happen there. Now, let me erase some of this so I have a, a cleaner area to write here. So this is a very sensitive area and it's very sensitive to changes in pressure. So when we have a situation, let's pick pressure, where pressure is increased overall because you have atherosclerosis or you have uh, high blood pressure hypertension or you have hyperlipidemia and there's an uh, overexpressed amount of lipidemia or of lipids in the blood and as a result of that you have a very high level of uh, you have hyperlipoproteinemia so you have a lot of extra proteins in the blood or you have dyslipoproteinemia where you have a decrease in protein in the blood this is going to change the pressure down here, okay? And it's generally going to increase pressure. So if we have this massive increase in pressure, what happens is these capillaries, they don't like that because uh, they're, only, they're only basically single layers of endothelial cells that are just kind of holding on for dear life. And if there's an increase in pressure here, what happens is they can burst, they can pop open. So let's say we have an increase in pressure. Well, then we're gonna have a burst, a bursting of the capillaries. And uh, I told you that vesicle, I'm sorry, not vesicle, vascular wall integrity was really important, right? So this is my burst color. And what happens is when these capillaries burst, all of the content that's in the capillaries starts to spew out, right? And that could be, it depends on how much damage you have. That can be just water. That could be protein. That could be red blood cells. That could be solutes. That could be lipids. It could be many, many, many different things. And depending on the type of injury, that can lead to an inflammatory response. This is a flame in case you're wondering. 
uh, and flames usually have yellow, right? So we'll put some yellow in there. And is there orange? Does, does this flame have orange? Let's get rid of that color and let's put some orange. Right? So we have fire. So you can have an inflammatory response if the damage is great, right? And then you're going to have to have all of those things we talked about come to repair. Um, but there is some type of edema, right? Because that's what this is. This is, an, this is edema. There's some type of edema where you just have water pushed out and no presence of proteins, right? So that's going to be the difference is what is in the liquid that is being pushed out? Is there lots of proteins? Is there lots of solutes? Or is there less, is there a very little of those things, those things? And that's what's going to determine how, um, whether or not you're going to have an inflammatory response or not. Okay. So let's move back up here. So as you can see here, I have a couple different drawings of a portion of a capillary. And here you can see that I have the single endothelial cells. I'm just going to kind of draw them in here. A very weak structure. Uh, it, it really likes to have low, low pressure because uh, that's where these things function best. And um, I put here single layer of endothelial cells. So one of the things that happens here, let's pick, uh, let's get rid of that highlighter. Let's pick another color. This looks like oxygen. Let's pick that one. One of the things that happens here is the red blood cells. Oops, that is not what I wanted. Sorry about that. Maybe where is, okay, let's pick that guy. There we go. Um, so one of the things that happens here sorry about that, is we have oxygen being pushed out and CO2 being pulled back in. Um, now, if there is a change in those hydrostatic pressures or onconic pressure, then that can alter this task here. So maybe you have as a result, more CO2 being pulled back into the blood and less oxygen being pushed out. And if CO2 is very abundant in the blood, that is going to alter blood pH. So that could be problematic, right? Um, what's another thing? Um, let's just do, let's do water. Let's do H2O. Uh, that looks watery. So the other thing that happens is we have H2O circulating in the blood, right? And the pressure that manages uh, what is pushed out and what is pulled back in, again, hydrostatic pressure and onconic pressure, that regulates this process. So we could have water being pushed out, and then we could also have water being pushed back in. And this is a, this is a really delicate dance, right? Because as I told you, there's all these cells over here, and these cells in the interstitial space are bathed in interstitial fluid and 90% of that is water, right? So the, 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 the health and the wellness of these cells down here uh, is dependent on pressure maintained in the blood, especially hydrostatic and iconic pressure. Uh, because if one of these pressures are too strong, it might push in too much water. And then what happens to these cells here is they start to shrink and shrivel and then they start to look like that. Uh, so you start to take their water away, which is what happens when you eat uh, lots of uh, lots of sodium. Um, so water is another thing. So we have we have oxygen and we have water. Uh, what's another thing that happens here? Let's go this color. Um, we have um, let's say I'm going to just put an H for hormones, and we have P for protein. And we have G for glucose, because all these things are also floating around um, in the in the in the in the blood as well. So if these things like hormones or proteins or glucose, they need to get to the cells, well, they're going to be regulated by that onconic and that hydrostatic pressure. So with the protein and the hormones, what might happen here is, and you know this, is they might have to undergo um, exocytosis or. or not, not exocytosis, but they're going to be taken in through endocytosis. And I'll, I'll explain that exocytosis thing in a minute. So we might have some vesicles, um, maybe lysosomes, um, phagosomes, things like that. Well, not phagosomes because that would want to degrade it. Um, but these carrion molecules that are going to bring the proteins in and bring the hormones in. And then they'll basically encapsulate those things into these 
carry in vesicles, right? Hormones and proteins, and they'll drop them off to the cells that need to be, that need these, these goods, right? Um, and the same thing is true. Here's what that exocytosis, same thing that is true with exocytosis is if we're getting rid of proteins or if we're getting rid of certain things that we need to put in the blood, those vesicles will bring, oh my gosh, bring them to the blood vessels and then they will exocytose. And this happens in the capillaries as well. So now these vesicles can get into the bloodstream. And then we have glucose, which glucose is going to be pushed into the cells, right? And they will do so through these transporters. So we'll have glucose circulating in the blood, and then they will transport into the interstitial space, and all these cells uh, will be waiting for that glucose to be uh, taken up and go through glycolysis, right? So there's these all these really important processes that are happening and any change in arterial, or not arterial, in capillary integrity, uh, capillary um, pressure will alter this function. And then if we look at the outside of the capillary, so this is, this is the opening to the capillary, right? Um, and then we'll just say that this is um, the deoxygenated end. So we'll just kind of make this blue for being deoxygenated, right? The venous end. The capillary, the outside of the capillary is filled with all of these holes, right? And these holes are called fenestrated gaps. And basically it's like having a hose with a whole bunch of needle holes in it. And that's how these proteins, right? And hormones leave the capillary. So we'll say protein, hormone, glucose, water, right? That's how they get out of the capillaries through these, these kind of Swiss cheese holes that are lining the entirety of the capillary. All right. So that's just kind of an overview of how these things kind of move in and out. Now we're going to talk about the meat and potatoes of this entire lecture, which is the hydrostatic, hydrostatic and the onconic pressure. So let me just kind of cue up this thing, uh, this slide really quick, and then we will get going on it. Okay, here we go. Let's uh, let's get into the meat and potatoes. So, let's just quickly look at. Let's just quickly review here. We have um, arterial side over here, right? And then over here we have our venous end of the capillary bed. And if you don't remember what that looks like, here we go. We have the arterial side, uh, which is right here, and then we have the. Uh, venous in which is right here right and we know that that the only difference between that is the the blood is uh dropped off everything on the arterial end and it is picking up things on the venous end okay so let's talk about force let's talk about hydrostatic force or hydrostatic pressure and i'm just going to say h um oops not working why is it not working now there you go hydrostatic pressure um, and, um, this is, this hydrostatic pressure is essentially the exact same thing as blood pressure. It's just a, a cooler name for it. Okay. Um, on the inside of the cap or on the inside of the capillary, hydrostatic pressure, blood pressure is much greater inside than it is outside. So outside of the capillary in the interstitial space, hydrostatic pressure is lower. Okay. So that sets us up for net movement of goods, right? If this pressure is greater on the inside, it's going to want to essentially push things out. So this discrepancy in force is what is going to push drive these things out of the capillary bed. So it's basically drives filtration, right? So this discrepancy in force between hydrostatic and uh, inside and outside is the discrepancy that drives the filtration outwards. Um, now this is generated by the difference between pressure inside and outside of the capillary. That is the main thing to consider here. Um, 
and then um, we have basically this bulk flow driven by the balance of this these two forces, right? Uh, and in this case, we're talking about the outside outside force being less than the inside force. Um, now, so that's going to drive bulk flow outwards. Now, there's also um, when we get to this side over here, let's do, uh, let's say, draw this line. Okay, so now when we start looking at the other side of the capillary, which is the venous in, what happens here is hydrostatic force or pressure begins to decrease. So on one side of the capillary, it might be, let's go back to that slide, 33 millimeters of force. And then as we move over to this venous in, it might drop and it might be 25. Or I've seen some textbooks say 20, why is this not working, 21 of millimeters of force, okay? So essentially what's happening is we have this drop in pressure from the arterial to the venous in. And that's really important because this drop in pressure on this end is going to help drive the reabsorption of things because since the hydrostatic pressure has lessened, we're not going to have this bulk flow of things moving out like we did over here. I'm just going to say bulk flow because we know on this arterial side, everything wants to get pushed out. But once we drop off that cargo, this hydrostatic pressure begins to drop on this side, and then that's going to help drive the bulk flow here for reabsorption. All right, so I hope that makes sense. Okay, so I cleaned this up a little bit, and what I want to talk about now is the onconic pressure. Okay, and I just kind of I put this here, onconic pressure, OP and OP. And again, onconic pressure it, it exists both inside the capillary and outside of the capillary. And what onconic pressure is composed of is proteins. So as long as protein concentrations in the blood remain unchanged, that means onconic pressure remains unchanged. And what's interesting about onconic pressure is whether it's on the arterial side or on the venous side, it usually remains the same. And we can just say that this is uh, 20 millimeters over here and then 20 millimeters of pressure over here, okay? So it generally is unchanged. And again, this is protein dependent and this is going to be what governs the drawing of fluids and goods back in, okay? So um, this is also regulated by the pressure differences between onconic pressure inside the cell or inside the, uh, the capillary and onconic pressure outside of the capillary. All right. So we have both of these pressures in and out. You can see here, I'll draw a picture one more time, hydrostatic pressure in the capillary, hydro hydrostatic pressure outside of the capillary, onconic pressure in the capillary, which is generally maintained, onconic pressure outside of the capillary um, and it is all protein dependent because again remember we have proteins out here as well right they're not just in the bloodstream so let's um, let me clean this up again for one second and then we'll kind of figure out how all this stuff is working okay so I cleaned it up a little more and I have this last piece here so in these giant red arrows here I'm just basically telling you that this is the hydrostatic force and the hydrostatic force on the venous end, I'm sorry, on the arterial end is about 35 millimeters of pressure. Okay. So that pressure is greater than the onconic pressure. Do you see that? The onconic pressure is um, 25 and then outside of the outside of the capillary, the onconic, the hydrostatic pressure is much lower than on the inside of the capillary. So this is what's going to push out water, okay? 
because there's this discrepancy within the forces. And because of that discrepancy, water, oxygen, things like that are all going to be pushed out. Okay, now this is the interesting part. I told you that as we move further down the capillary, we have a decrease in hydrostatic pressure. And on average, that change in pressure can go from 35 to about 13 or 17. Okay. Now I told you that on conic pressure stays the same depending on protein. So if this is 25 and this is 13, which one has the higher pressure? You're going to say 25 is higher, right? So because of that protein in the blood, that's going to cause things to move back in because the pressure pulling in is greater than the pressure pushing out. All right. So um, when we have edema, which is the whole point of what we're talking about, these pressures are altered and they're changed and the pressure being pushed in and the pressure being pulled out is no longer regulated. And that's why this onconic pressure is so important. I told you if we lose protein concentrations or if we get too much protein, that's going to alter the relationship with these pressures. Uh, so if, if we wanted, if we started to develop a, a problem with um, our, our protein concentrations as a result of a disease, let's say that now our onconic pressure was 10 millimeters instead of 25, what would happen here? Well, now the hydrostatic pressure over here is still greater than this. So we would still have water being pushed out when it should be pulled back in. And that's where we get edema. That's where we get damage to the vascular, the microvascular system. And that's where we get things pushed out uh, when they should be getting pulled back in. Okay, so that's my drawing for you guys.